Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Calvary Lemon Grove. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thanks for this roof you have over our head. Thanks for the Bibles in this room, your word. We ask you move among us today, Lord. Open us. Help us to worship freely. Any distractions we may have carried in, I pray that you would push those aside. We love you, Lord. We lift this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You'll join us in standing. We'll worship our Lord together. Heaven's mercy 
take our hearts for us saying, thank you so much for holding us close. Amen. Take a moment, say hi to someone. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Lemon Grove. We're glad you're here this morning. And we pray that the Lord makes this just a rich and blessed experience for each and every soul that is in this room today. Some of you know that on Friday, Kay Smith went to be with the Lord. And so, uh, would you guys mind putting up that first picture? This is a picture that, uh, that Pastor Chuck took of Kay. And I'm going to read you a post that his that their daughter, uh, Jeanette, put up on face, uh, Facebook on Friday. She said, Dad took this photo of Mama on the steps of the church in downtown Huntington Beach, which is now called Hope Chapel. Dad was the pastor there, and Mama was variously the Sunday school superintendent, the pianist, the song leader, the wedding consultant, the VBS organizer, and the writer, producer, and director of an exciting Christmas play set in Bible times and starring my dad. She was a woman of many talents, and she poured herself into the ministry alongside Dad. After all those years of hard work, today she quietly fell asleep and breathed her last as Jeff and I held her hands and told her how much we love and honor her. Our beautiful mama lives in heaven now. So um, I just thought that was a really neat post. And uh, go to the next picture, please. So uh, I, I wanted to read to you a little note that Pastor Chuck made in his introduction to Kay's book, Pleasing God. Kay, Kay Smith has touched more lives than you can possibly imagine, and I have never met two more godly people than Chuck and Kay Smith. Uh, and, and Kay played such a big role in the Calvary Chapel ministry, and this is what Chuck wrote. He said, for the last 60 years, I have had the privilege of watching my wife, Kay Smith, live out these principles to please God. Over time, she has been a blessed helpmate in our ministry, uh, Kay was the first to reach out to the hippies of the 60s. Her prayers and her tears laid the foundation for our church, Calvary Chapel. So, you know, in case you didn't know the history, there wouldn't be a Calvary Chapel without these two. And we probably wouldn't be here worshiping together if it wasn't for the ministry that, that they accomplished and that they did over the years. So um, just if you think about it this week, take a moment to pray for... Chuck and Kay's family, they're, they're dealing with the grief and, and the loss. And, and like I said, it's bittersweet. Bitter because we miss Kay. She is a dear, sweet woman. And sweet because we know she has been reunited with Chuck in heaven. And so um, they are suffering no pain, no sorrow, no tears, no discomfort. They're walking those streets of gold right now. If we should be sad for anyone, it should be for us because we're still here. And this place is a royal mess right now. So um, just keep the, the Smith family in your prayers this week, would you please? And now I would like to ask Michael to come forward. Michael is going to read Psalm 99 for us today. So if you have your Bibles handy and you'd like to follow along, he'll be in Psalm 99. Okay. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble, he dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved, the Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples, let them praise your great and awesome name, he is holy, the king's strength also loves justice. You have, a, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives. Though you took vengeance on their deeds, exalt the Lord our God. 
and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Amen. Good job, Michael. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, if you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, he is to you the God who forgives. And if that isn't a comforting thought this morning, I don't know what is. Now the worship team is going to play one more song. If you would like to support the Lord's work through your tithes and offerings, there is an agape box in the hallway. If you are a first-time visitor, please just receive what God has for you. We want you to be blessed this morning to enjoy what God has done for you. Jesus, I'm ready. 
Lord, thank you for holding us so close. I pray that you would keep us forever. Amen. 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 Have, uh, have you guys been watching the news yesterday <laughs> and today a little bit? So some of you may or some of you may be aware, but others of you may not be aware that uh, the city of Kabul was breached either last night or this morning, and Afghanistan is about to fall, and it looks like the rerun of a really bad movie, because I remember when that helicopter lifted off from the roof of our embassy in South Vietnam in 1975, and it just feels like the same thing is happening all over again. And so that's why I was saying earlier, what a mess. What a mess we have created for ourselves. This is what happens when you try to do things your way instead of God's way. This, this is what you get when you try to eliminate him from public discourse. So I don't want to go too far down that road because it, it is depressing because we human beings have made such a hopeless mess of government. Um, but the good news is Soon, very soon, the government is going to be on his shoulder. And then we're going to know what true and good government really is. So would you please join me in turning to Colossians chapter 4. All right, you may be seated. Satan's pretty feeble, isn't he? He tries to stop God's word from getting up, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You might remember at the end of Colossians chapter 3, Paul was dealing with interpersonal relationships, as he did in Ephesians chapter 5. He talked about the wife's relationship to the husband, and how husbands are to love their wives, children are to obey their parents, fathers should not provoke their children to anger, and at the very end of chapter 3, he talked about servants and their masters. It seems like they should have included the first verse of chapter 4 with the last verse of chapter 3, because they're related very closely. The first verse of chapter 4 ends the section dealing with interpersonal relationships, having dealt with servants' responsibilities toward their masters. Today's equivalent would be employees and their responsibilities to their employers. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1 uh, He's going to speak now of his um, of the employer's responsibilities to their employees. So it's a two-way street, you know. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1 begins, Masters, give your servants what is just and fair. In other words, he was calling on employers to pay their employees a fair wage. Verse 1 continues, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is something that we really need to remember. Nobody can rule properly unless they are ruled. One day, we are all going to answer to the Lord. I have a master in heaven, and I will give an account to him. You remember when the centurion sent to Jesus concerning his servant who was sick, and the people said, oh, this centurion, he's really a great guy. He contributed to the synagogue, and he's a just ruler. And Jesus said, well, I will come to his house. No doubt someone got word to the centurion that Jesus was coming to his house. The centurion's wife probably said, oh, no, no, he can't come here. The house is a mess. Don't let him come. I don't want all the people crowding around here. The centurion sent back to Jesus and said, you don't have to come. And then the centurion said, I understand what authority is about. I am a man of authority, and I am under authority. I can tell my servant, go, and he goes. I can say to another, come, and he comes. I understand what authority is about. All you have to do is just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus marveled at the centurion's faith, saying, I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel. This is about the chain of command and authority. Now, maybe you are the owner of the business, but one day we're going to answer to the Lord. One of the many problems today with government, and there are many, that is an understatement. For example, even the Supreme Court 
one of the problems they have is the failure to recognize that they are not the highest court. One day, they're going to be held responsible for their decisions. Just as Harry Blackman wrote the majority opinion in the Roe v. Wade case on the issue of abortion, and he later said that it troubled him for many years. That's good. But then he said, I now feel very good about it. That's bad. Blackman retired from the Supreme Court in 1994 and died in 1999. There came a day when he had to answer to God for the millions of babies that had been aborted since the decision that he made as a member of the United States Supreme Court. Whenever you put a person who doesn't understand that they are under authority into power, you always develop a tyrannical government. Masters, if you're an employer, if you own a business, if you have employees, give them a fair and just salary. That's how Paul ended the section dealing with interpersonal relationships. Now he says in verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You remember that back in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul indicated that he was always praying for the Colossians. Here in chapter 4, he urges those same Colossians to continue earnestly in prayer. The Greek word that's translated continue is built on a root meaning to be strong. It connotes earnest adherence to a person or a thing. In this passage, it implies persistence and fervor. This sort of earnest prayer is important, but it doesn't come easily. Earnestly in prayer speaks of great effort that is steadily applied. We're also told to be thankful in this verse. Be a thankful person. This applies to everyone, whether you're a master or a servant. One morning during the Middle Ages, they had an eclipse. People woke up expecting the day to dawn as normal. When it didn't, they cried, oh no, the sun didn't rise today. At first, this was a curiosity, but then it became a real concern for them. People began to scream, wail, and howl. When the sun finally appeared, the people cheered and clapped, blessed God for the very sunshine that they had once taken for granted. How good it would be for us to wake up and say, thank you, Father, for a new day. I'm alive. The sun is up. There's air to breathe. I'm not a slug, which is a shellless terrestrial gastropod mollusk that gets stepped on or eaten by a bird, just so you know. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. You'd be hard pressed to find something more abhorrent than a grumpy believer. Don't they realize how good, how merciful, how gracious God has been? To them, they're going to heaven. They have the word. The spirit of the living God indwells them. I don't think there's a single excuse for a rational person to be grumpy. Praise and thanksgiving should be constantly flowing from our lips. Verse 3. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery or the hidden truth of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that, it, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, remember where Paul was when he was writing this. It's intriguing. Paul says, pray for us. Not for us to be released from this prison, but that the word should go forth from here. Now, be honest. If you were in prison, what would you write? If it was me, I might just write, please pray for me that I would be freed from this place. I'm tired of being in prison. That's not what Paul says. He says, my desire is that God's word should go forth from here, that those around me will really see that Christ lives in me. Now that's the way to pray. Do you remember the billboards that they used to put up about God? You could see them as you drove around town. They were, some of them were pretty, pretty funny, actually. One said, Big Bang Theory, you've got to be kidding. It's God. <laughs> you think it's hot now? Just keep using my name in vain. God. <laughs> Don't make me come down there. God. <laughs> well, one of those billboards said, pray, it works. 
And that's true. But what if it doesn't work? Most of the time we pray small prayers like, get me out of here. And when they don't work, rather than learning what prayer really is, we stop praying. Prayer is not our opportunity to get God to see things our way. Rather, prayer is our opportunity to see things God's way. I read a story about a woman from Arkansas. This woman was confronted by a burglar who, after ripping her phone from the wall, you know, back in those days when everybody had a hardwired landline phone in their house, he ordered her into the closet after he ripped her phone from the wall. And after she dropped to her knees, she asked the burglar if she could pray for him. Is that what you would pray for? She told him, I want you to know that God loves you and that he forgives you and that I forgive you. And I don't know what kind of a reaction she was expecting, but the burglar looked at her and apologized for what he had done. He yelled out the door to his partner, who was waiting in a pickup truck. We've got to unload all this stuff. She's a Christian lady. We can't do this to her. The woman remained on her knees while the burglar returned all the furniture that he had already taken from her home. He then took the bullets out of his gun, handed her the gun, and walked out the door. Now this lady could have prayed, get me out of here. We would understand that, but she didn't. Instead, she prayed like Paul. She asked the burglar, can I pray for you? Now that's in harmony with God's heart. How do we know that? Think back to what Jesus said on the cross. He said, well, he didn't say, get me out of here. That's for sure. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's from Luke chapter 23. In other words, they don't understand what's happening. They don't understand what's going on. How I want to be more like Paul. What a great role model he is for us. And I've got so much to learn in this arena but I see the principle and the rightness of what Paul is modeling as he prays not to get out of prison, but instead that he would have boldness and wisdom in any situation. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Don't waste time. We don't get very much of it. Walk wisely. For people are watching you. Time is moving rapidly, so redeem it. Somehow, we all think we're going to live a long time. James was right when he said that life is a vapor, a puff of steam. In James chapter 4, it's going so fast. Make it count. How? Redeem it. According to those who study such things, the average American will spend six months of their life waiting at red lights. And people say, I don't have time to pray. But what if they decided that at every red light, they pray for people in their fellowships, for people in their communities who don't know Jesus, for people in the world who have never heard his name? What if they decided to keep an open Bible on the seat next to them so they could read a verse or two every time they're stopped at a red light? Please don't do it while the car is in motion. People say they don't have time to pray, time to read, time to memorize, time to study. Yes, they do. I'm not talking about getting up and 3 in the morning. I'm talking about using the time when you're at stoplights. Redeem the time. Verse 6, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now this is interesting. It used to be that salty speech was a reference to the use of profanity, but that's not what Paul is talking about. The idea here is that of salty french fries. Now, when I was growing up, Carl's Jr. had the best fries on the planet, bar none. You can ask Karen, she remembers. They were crinkle cut, crispy on the outside, soft on the inside. And of course, they were salted. They went great with ketchup. Now, I love salty fries, but when I have them, I've got to have a cold drink. Why? Because they make me thirsty. Salt stimulates thirst. And in the same way, our speech should create a thirst for that living water in other people's hearts. When people see 
our lives, when they watch our lives, they should say, I don't know what he or she has, but I want it because I don't have it. And that's what stimulating thirst in other people's lives is all about. Verse 7, Tychicus, who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. So Tychicus delivered this epistle to the church at Colossae. Paul was in prison at Rome when he wrote it. He wrote Ephesians and Colossians at, at approximately the same time, and then Tychicus carried this epistle. A little later, we're going to see that Paul wrote an epistle to the Laodiceans at the same time, and they were to trade these letters back and forth. They were to read the epistle before us in the church, and then read the letter that Paul had sent to the Laodiceans. Tychicus was the one who brought these epistles from Paul to the churches in Asia Minor. Verse 8, I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Tychicus was sent to Colossae to report to the believers there how Paul was, was doing and to bring back word to Paul how they were doing. Now this shouldn't surprise us because Paul was not only a soul winner, he was also a friend maker. As you read Paul's letters, you'll find more than 100 people to whom he sends greetings. Verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Now, if you're a student of the word, you will know that Onesimus plays a key role in the book of Philemon. Onesimus was, in fact, a runaway slave. He ended up in prison as a cellmate of Paul's. He got saved, and he was released from prison. And here we see that he turned out to be a faithful and beloved brother. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin or in the King James Version, the sister's son of Barnabas, about whom he received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, Acts chapter 13 tells us that Barnabas was Paul's companion on his first missionary journey. He was the one who went to Tarsus and found Paul after Paul's conversion. Barnabas came and found him when there was a need in the church at Antioch for someone who really understood the Greek culture and who could minister to the Gentiles. He got Paul involved in the ministry. Paul and Barnabas set off on their first missionary journey. They took a young man named John Mark with them. Now, John Mark was Barnabas' nephew, or his sister's son. Sometime during the early part of the journey, in Pamphylia, John Mark got frightened and went home. And when it came time for Paul and Barnabas to take their second missionary journey, Barnabas said, I'll get John Mark and we'll be on our way. Paul said, hold on. John Mark flipped out on us and failed us the last time. He's not coming again. And Barnabas said, yes, he is. Barnabas, the son of comfort. Paul said, no way. There's work to do. We can't have this guy tag along with us. He just doesn't have what it takes. Barnabas said, I'm taking John Mark. Paul said, fine, go your way. I'll take Silas and we'll go in a different direction. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. So they parted company, and years later, we see that Barnabas' work with John Mark was successful. For here in the book of Colossians, Paul salutes John Mark. I find hope in this story. Many of us feel like we've missed the mark, so to speak that God opened a door for us to do something, but we failed to do so. Take heart. I don't care how badly you have messed up. God is not through with you. Do you want to talk about failure? There was a guy who had less than three years of formal education. In 31, he failed in business. He ran for the state legislature in 32. He failed again in business in 34. He was finally elected to the state legislature in 35. He ran for speaker and lost in a landslide. He was defeated for elector in 40 and for Congress in 43. He got himself elected to Congress in 46, but he was tossed out of office two years later in losing his reelection bid. He failed in business yet again 
and in 55, he ran for the Senate, but he was defeated. He ran for vice president in 56 and got crushed. He was defeated for a Senate seat once again in 58, and then in 60, 1860, Abraham Lincoln won. And he went on to become perhaps the greatest political leader in American history. Could it be that the wit, the wisdom, and the understanding of human nature that he so powerfully exhibited came as a result of the setbacks, the failures, and the defeat that Lincoln had previously experienced? That's why you shouldn't despair. John Mark badly blew it. But ultimately, he came through, and so can you. Colossians chapter 4, verse 11. And Jesus, who is called justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Of this man, we really know nothing but his name. He's numbered among these men who were comforters to Paul while he was in Roman custody, preceding his trial before Caesar. Now, Paul was taken into custody because of a Jewish riot on the Temple Mount over the mere mention of God's offer of grace to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 22 tells us that story. Some things never change, do they? God's offer of grace to the Gentiles still causes outrage among many to this day. Now, Jesus, who is called Justice, would be the name Joshua in the Hebrew language. The fact that he was of the circumcision indicates that he was Jewish. Paul says that these three men, Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice, were his only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who were of the circumcision. So we know that there were a few Israelites in the church at Colossae, but there weren't many. The Colossian church was comprised mostly of Gentile believers. Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice were wonderful brethren and great missionaries in their own right. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So Epaphras was the pastor in Colossae. Now he was in prison. So he had a new ministry, the ministry of prayer. J. Vernon McGee once received a letter from a young preacher who had become paralyzed and was thus unable to preach anymore. This young man was understandably discouraged. McGee answered him by saying, I have a job for you. Pray for me. Prayer is a ministry too. If God has taken you out of active service, pray for God's service. It simply means that God has given you a new ministry. He has something different for you to do. Verse 12 says that Epaphras labored fervently in prayer. The idea there is one of giving birth, going through pain to bring forth prayer. I have been told on a fairly reliable account that birth is a painful experience. Sometimes that's what it takes. Do you ever feel like not praying? Am I the only one who begins to pray and then I get distracted and I succumb to the list of other things that I have to tend to first? This was not the case with Epaphras. He labored in prayer until there was a breakthrough, a birth of renewal and revival in the hearts and lives of those for whom he prayed. And we should all have such dedication. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Epaphras prayed well because he cared well. If he lagged in zeal, he would have lagged in prayer. Now these three cities, Colossae, Herapolis, and Laodicea, were located closely together. Herapolis and Laodicea were somewhere between about six and 10 miles apart. And both of those cities were near Colossae. And there were churches in all three of those cities. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now on the surface, you might think that verse doesn't say all that much, but it says a lot more than you really think it does. This is the one passage which informs us that Luke, the human author of the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, was a physician. His works are written with a more scientific, analytical mindset. Think of Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. They have a lot of detail in which a physician would be interested. It is possible that Luke was in Rome to deliver a document that he had recently finished. 
The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts may together have been what they call an amicus curiae, or friend of the court report, perhaps explaining to the Romans why Paul stood before Caesar's court. Now as for Demas, in Philemon verse 24, Paul included him in a list of his fellow laborers. That list also included Mark, Aristarchus, and Luke. The book of Philemon was written a couple of years before Colossians. So at one point, Paul had called Demas his fellow laborer. Here in Colossians, Paul doesn't say anything positive about him. This might indicate that Paul wasn't really sure about Demas at the time of this writing. The only thing that Paul says is that he, Demas, greets the Colossian Christians. He must have been known to them. And about six years after this, Paul mentions Demas one last time in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. In that verse, Paul writes, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. What a tragic regression. Demas went from being a fellow laborer to one who turned his back on the Lord because he loved the world. How did this happen? Well, think of it this way. The Christian life is like a steam locomotive. When you're first saved and you're on fire, you stoke the boiler with the word of God. You come to church, you're involved in ministry, and you're moving along in your faith. But there might come a time when you start to think, you know, I'm cruising along just fine. I don't need to feed the fire so fervently. I don't need to study, study scripture so consistently. I don't need to have devotions daily. I don't need to go to church regularly because look, I'm really moving. But once the fire stops getting fed, the engine imperceptibly starts to slow down. Yes, the train keeps moving down the tracks for a time and everything might appear to be going along fine, but little by little, the engine goes slower and slower until it finally stops dead in its tracks. The law of inertia, which is also known as Newton's first law of motion, states that an object will continue to be in a state of rest or in a state of motion until an external force acts on it. In the case of our steam locomotive, the force that overcomes inertia is generated by the expansion of steam. That expansion is, fur is fueled by burning combustible material, coal, oil, or perhaps wood, to heat water in the locomotive's boiler to the point where it becomes gaseous and its volume increases greatly. So you didn't know you'd be getting a physics lesson when you came to church today, did you? But wait, there's more. <laughs> From his experiments, Galileo deduced that a body in motion would remain in motion unless a force such as friction caused it to come to rest. Now friction is defined as the force that resists the sliding or rolling of one solid object over another. Frictional forces present a great measure of opposition to motion. Simply put, those forces are what cause our locomotive to slow down once the greater force of energy is no longer being applied. The application is this. You might be able to go for weeks, months, or even years on the momentum that you gained in the early days. But if you don't continue to feed the fire, you will eventually stop altogether. And then, like Demas, you could find yourself saying, what happened? How did I end up here? Verse 15. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus in the church that is in his house. As we said earlier, Laodicea, along with Herapolis, was a neighboring city of Colossae. Perhaps the name Laodicea sounds familiar to you. The church at Laodicea eventually received a scathing rebuke from the Lord Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus condemned that church for its lukewarmness. That lukewarmness is nauseating to God. It speaks of a compromise. That compromise results in a church becoming apostate. We don't know much about Nymphus. There's been debate about whether Paul was referring to a man or a woman when he used this name. Some manuscripts have the masculine form, some have the feminine form. In either case, the church met in Nymphus' house. The early church had no buildings, you see. It wasn't until the, the third century or thereabouts that the church ended up meeting in dedicated facilities. 
They met as house churches because few houses were large. There were usually several house churches in a, a city of any size, each with a pastor or elder over it. Now the cities to which Paul was referring had great heathen temples, but the Christians met in homes. It could be that as the church started in homes, it will come back to homes. If you don't think that could happen, take a good look at the trouble that is swirling around us today. Did you ever think that you would see the day in which the government, against the Constitution, against the Bill of Rights, ordered churches to close while pot dispensaries, abortion clinics, and liquor stores were allowed to remain open? Did you ever think you'd see the day in which that same government would try to force churches to deny their sincerely held beliefs and to cover abortion in their employee insurance plans? These issues are not going to go away. We could conceivably reach a point where churches are no longer able to meet as they do right now. They could be forced underground. Verse 16, now when this epistle is read among you, See that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. In other words, pass this letter on to the church at Laodicea, and they'll pass theirs on to you. Now, when Paul and the other apostles wrote letters to churches, they would publicly read the letters to the congregations. It was a way for the apostle to teach that church, even when he couldn't personally be there. Also, it was a general practice to distribute all apostolic all apostolic letters among the churches, especially those that were close to each other. And apparently Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. We don't have this letter, but Paul probably wrote it around the same time as he wrote the book of Colossians. Verse 17, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Do what God has told you to do, Archippus. And that's good advice for us as well. Do whatever it is that God has told you to do. We're wise to keep doing whatever he has individually and corporately laid upon our hearts in order to bring it to completion. Archippus had a gift, and Paul urged him to use it. Verse 18, this salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. So Paul dictated most of his letters. The letter to the Galatians he wrote with his own hand. But here he gives signature to the letter that he has dictated. This is the second time that Paul says, remember my chains. At the beginning of the chapter, Paul instructed the Colossians to be thankful. And he asked them to pray that he would be able to minister, even in prison. Here at the end, Paul tells them to remember his chains, not as a play for sympathy, but as a basis for his authority. He opened his epistle, epistle with the salutation of grace, and now he closes it with a benediction of grace. As it began, so it ends, because grace is really the whole deal. Next week, we are going to begin a study in the book of 1 Timothy, so read ahead. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much for the time we have enjoyed in the book of Colossians. What a rich book it is though it's only four short chapters. So much knowledge, so much of your heart, so much of the compassion and the love that you feel toward us is present. And we look forward, Lord, to what you're going to do in the book of 1 Timothy. We look forward to, to learning what you have for us in that book. And so we pray that you would stir our hearts and our minds and just help us, Lord understand and to apply that which you have recorded for us. Your word is truth. We will proclaim it and we will accept it and we will do our best to live it, Lord, with your help, with the inspiration and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you. Help us to remember you now and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Tom is now going to lead us in communion. Morning. Good morning. This morning I was praying.
asking God to give me a word about communion today. And I was expecting a scripture, something from the Bible. And instead, the word that popped into my brain was discombobulation. You heard that word? It's a strange word. Like any good student, I Google it to find out what the definition was. It just means confused and disconcerted. But it's one of the few words that if you take away the prefix, the dis, and leave combobulation, it's not a word. It's not a legitimate word you won't find in the dictionary. So I think that's interesting. I like words like that. But in thinking about it, kind of going along with Pastor Sean has already said, our world is unraveling. I know we keep telling you that, and maybe you're tired of hearing it, but every week more things are happening that are just showing that the people that are in charge are crazy. They don't know God. They make poor decisions, and that leads to more poor decisions, and things are changing. They're not going to go back the way they were, and it's easy for us to get discombobulated, and God doesn't want us to do that, okay? And you know we're in a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual warfare, so it's not just about uh, material things. There's more to it than that, that Satan is working in ways that are more and more bold, more and more insane, and a surprising number of people, well, I guess maybe it isn't surprising, are agreeing with Satan's ideas and saying, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do that. And it's discombobulated, or at least it can be. So I found in, my, in some notes, some old notes of mine, something that Julie said was on the internet for years that I just want to share with you. It's the difference between God's voice and Satan's voice. If you feel like you're discombobulated at any, at any moment, let me think about this. That God's voice stills us, and Satan's voice rushes us, pushes us to do something. God's voice leads you, and Satan's voice pushes you. God's voice reassures you, and Satan's voice frightens you. Is there any fear in the air these days, motivating us to do things? God's voice enlightens you, and Satan's voice confuses you. If you feel confused, you know that's an idea or a concept or a thing that is being pushed from Satan. God encourages you, Satan discourages you. God's voice comforts you, Satan's voice worries you. God's voice calms you, Satan's voice obsesses you. Know anybody that's obsessed? Mm -hmm. More and more of that happening. God's voice convicts you of sin, which brings you back to him. Satan's voice condemns you. He wants you to become discouraged and discombobulated and give up. And being a Christian as the years go by is going to be harder and harder. We've had it really easy. It's been easy to be a Christian, and it's not going to be so easy in the coming, uh, coming years. So with that happy thought in mind... <laughs> Why don't we uh, pray a little bit and get ready for communion. Lord, uh, search our hearts. Help us to be strong and courageous, uh, to be in prayer, to be in your word, to trust you, Lord. Help us to have our faith be built um, as we walk with you. Help us to trust you in that, Lord. And that we wouldn't be obsessed or fearful or worry about the things that are going on in the world. Because um, you, 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 you don't have a part in that. You want us to uh, follow you and share the gospel and encourage one another. So help us, Lord, to do that more consistently and more effectively. In your name, Jesus, we pray.
to remember what Christ did on the cross, the victory he gave us, that enabled us to have a spiritual life. Can you imagine if you didn't know that, if that had not happened? How would you, how would you live in this world? What hope would you have for the future? Put a little thought into that, how that would change everything. The future is no longer certain. It's not no longer in, in control of God. It's just you. And that's how people that don't know Christ are feeling and, and handling this world that we live in. And it's quite different than what we think. So have a little compassion for them, maybe reach out a little bit more to them. On the night the Lord Jesus, uh, which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This, is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Gospel, chapter 13, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and Peter, James, and John came to him, and Andrew also, and asked him privately, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Speaking of the end times. And Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars, like in Afghanistan, perhaps, rumors of wars, do not be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. Did you know there was an earthquake in Haiti? I think it was Friday. It was, it was massive. It was a 7.2. And their building codes are not as strict as ours is. And the death toll is already estimated at thousands. There was another earthquake of pretty significant magnitude. I'm not sure where it was. Um, around the same time. Right? Earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. Anybody see any famines and troubles swirling around us right now? These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. And you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first, first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand, or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. The signs of the times are around us. The question is, are we observing them? Is it making an impact on us? We are in the times that are recorded in the pages of Scripture as the times when the end is upon us. So what should our response be? Is it depression? Is it discouragement? Is it despair? It should be look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Do you believe that today? Yeah. Your redemption draws nigh. So take that with you and let it give you an impetus, a drive, an empowerment to go out there and drag as many people with you as possible, kicking and screaming if necessary, into the kingdom of God. Because the time is short and surely the days are evil. So now may the Lord bless you. May he just pour out his mercy and his grace upon you. May he help you to understand the signs of the times. And may he help you to use that to drive you to make an eternal difference, to give you a love for the lost, to give you a, 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 an overriding sense, a need, a drive to go out there and to share his love with the people around you. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee, and keep thee, and keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. May God richly bless you. If you need prayer, Pastor Tom and Julie will be up here in the front, and they are able to pray with you. God bless you.